thank you for mo that moving speech, um, Mrs. Dylan Meth. Uh, what I'm going to talk is much lighter, maybe a bit critical, maybe a bit playful, and I hope you allow me to do that. Uh, the topic you all dealt with is very crucial, very important. Uh, in fact, uh, very, very important. What I'm talking is taking a completely another road, completely another perspective, talking about something very perhaps trivial, something silly, but yet very, very important in our everyday life and reality. So first of all, thank you. It's my first time, first time to be here. Uh, thank you, Manu, for inviting me, and thank you for having uh, given a chance to share some of my thoughts. Uh, I'm going, not going to be so articulate. I'm going to be random here and there, make it a bit casual. Uh, so uh, here we go. I'm an industrial designer, designer dealing with lots of different things, products, objects, and uh, uh, technologies. And obviously the real challenges are serious and uh, real challenges are serious and they can only be achieved or something can be done through collaborations. And I will also talk about some examples which I am bringing here, some historic examples, some may be known and some may be off-bit examples to show you here and share also some of my works. Uh, the first thing when you come here in, in this wonderful place, this uh, hotel, uh, Le Meridian, you have wonderful hospitality, a great personnel, a great staff taking care of you. And you look around and you see uh, tons of uh, design objects, products, and if you really have a uh, little bit insight into this world. Most of these products are from the Italian world, Italian design companies, and I always wonder why. Uh, I always wonder why they're all Italian manufacturers. No wonder they produce wonderful work. Uh, I have a great privilege to work, uh, uh, collaborate with many of them, uh, and I'm sh going to share some of the, those things. But having the kind of background we have, the heritage we have, the history we have, uh, the kind of craft skills we have and also we have a very good defined uh, long tradition of industrial culture in our country but why don't we have that cultural confidence to bring in something which is distinguishedly unique I don't want to say any nation's name here but has uh, a kind of pride and a, and, a, and a dignity in every object we, we have around us. I think one of that is the biggest trouble in our living environment, we have it. Uh, I don't want to be sound too critical, but uh, all of you know that and you travel around the world, and that comes from certain concern for way of living, certain concern for your own understanding of your environment, certain concern for cultural building. And the point I want to bring in here is the industrial culture we live in. The industry has the biggest power, I would say, uh, to build the culture, to cultivate the culture. So the industry has a power to, I would say, create culture. That may sound a bit obnoxious, that may sound a bit upbeat, but I truly believe that. And there are many examples here. We can see that industry has created culture. Uh, and, and all the built-up environment we have around us that creates us as well. We know many people have talked about it. You know, so that always been my concern and little I could do coming and engaging with uh, uh, my country that is India, though I live abroad, but I come here every year and since last 20 years I'm abroad, every time I come and I engage with different artisans, craftsmen, people, I could whatever I do in a personal capacity. Now, talking about the, the, the context I'm really talking about here is, is what is that missing link? What is that? Because there are great brains who are very brilliant people around the world. And what is that missing link which, which does not translate all of our resources, possibilities, whether it is in healthcare or whether it is a simple everyday activity, uh, into something which we can be proud of? And, and those missing links, one could go into details. You need an anthropological study about it. We need a critical cultural context. We need to also talk about critically about religion and so on and so forth. But, well, that doesn't allow me within the time given. But we can discuss that further later. Uh, but what is very fascinating thing is uh, how we could build up our cultural confidence. I allow me to say that. I don't say that. I don't mean to demean it. Uh, our reality, the cultural confidence in an industrial setting, in a technological setting, without copying anybody, without trying to imitate anybody, to create our own solutions and to address our own very fundamental needs. And that is the kind of human ingenuity, which is also something we have in abundance. We have a huge resource that is a human resource, tons of people. 
And can we get some lights down, please, so we can see the images a bit better? Can you have a lights down? So, th talking about human ingenuity, we have amazing examples around in our country. I'm just bringing a couple of them. Uh, looking at this thing, th this sounds like a, like a joke, but it is not. I mean, this is almost a reality. We, we, the educated one, the people who, like me, who went to IITs and had a possibility to go to school, hardly look at these possibilities. And also, we have to somehow look at that as a, as a possible opportunity, how we could tap into it. Uh, another thing is our culture, ways of life and things are full with design ideas. Design to me is not a superficial thing to look at to make it something beautiful. Design is a structural thinking, it's a tool to innovate, it's a tool to really address the specific need. And if you look in that perspective, I want to bring a very humble example. All of you probably have seen this and you know all of this, what is this pumpkin, you see all over the engine and you see the use of it. You know, it becomes a measuring thing as well as to serve it. Now, this seems like a very simple example, but we have to bring this example to high tech. And that's what doesn't happen in our country often. Uh, I want to bring in another example. I'm going to jump here and there. Allow me to do that. I'm not going to be very structured and systematic here, but some bunch of ideas. This is post-World War Italy in the northeast of, of uh, Veneto region of uh, Italy. This was a reality, not more than 55, 60 years ago. And today it's one of the biggest industrial hub, producing one of the best furnitures what you have here in Moroso and Capellini and, and BNB Italia, which is produced in the northern Italy, which I engage a lot. And this industrial reality, the transformation they, they did, believing their own cultural heritage and transforming into industrial possibility. And this icon they created, the Vespa Scooter, all of you know, and uh, just to give a little insight into it, it would not ever happen had, this is a first page in drawing from the Vespa Scooter, this man who was an aviation engineer who brought in the aviation technology into making, he, this is the, the, the helicopter he invented and got into making a scooter. Now that's a technology transfer, you know, and that gave us the idea and we finally became one of the lar largest uh, scooter manufacturing country, but the innovation and the icon was created thanks to the collaboration between these gentlemen. I'm going to bring a couple of other examples some of you might know. A uh, German company which was very successful after the Second World War called Brown, and there because of the Hans Julio and the uh, person called Erwin Brown, uh, having a very, very close co cooperation in terms of understanding of their reality and creating industrial products. These two gentlemen working together in a very clo close co cooperation to bring that kind of a thing, creating amazing industrial icons. If we would not have this, we wouldn't have this story, what we know, the success story of Apple today. And it's a direct link, those who know, we can look into that later. Now, uh, there are endless examples and the one of the other examples I want to bring in is Olivetti which was a very successful company, sadly it's not there that prominent anymore, but Olivetti was one of the most prominent company in 50s who manufactured all of his equipments and, and that has happened to this man at the research house, I had a privilege to know him personally and Roberto Olivetti. That is a kind of collaboration which led to. Now these collaborations went beyond just the business, it went just beyond, they created the culture. They had the vision, they had a belief, and, and the reality of their, uh, their uh, possibilities we have today in India, I, I think we are in a much more privileged position to make some, some of these things happen here. Now these were two gentlemen who created this thing and from that came this uh, Valentino typewriter which became icon and from that if you dig down a little bit you'll understand it became today the laptop we have thanks to this typewriter and with the handle so you can work anywhere in, the, in your garden and that was a huge innovation that time. And talking about one of the recent one, a recent collaboration between Bert Schultz the aviation engineer and Paul Allen, uh, the guy who was financing his XPRIZE which he won in uh, 2004 and later in 2007, they showed to take a trip in outer space uh, to, to uh, experience microgravity or zero gravity. Uh, now these kind of things happen because the collaborative minds, two meeting of two minds, the creative mind and the enterprising, the, the, the business mind, you know, working together seamlessly giving some of these fantastic results. And I think we have a lot to do in that area and we can create wonderful possibilities we have and the challenges we have in the country 
and they are endless. You all of us, we know about it. Uh, and that led to this XPRIZE, probably most of you know the XPRIZE, the 10 million US dollar XPRIZE founded by uh, Mr. P, uh, Dr. D, uh, Peter Diamandis. Uh, and that was a wonderful, uh, wonderful collaborative effort actually. And these are some hopeful examples. And these are not the examples I'm bringing just to praise one or the other person. But I think learning from anybody is not a trouble for me personally, from the guy on the street or a guy like Peter Diamandis. Uh, I'm going to talk to you something, I'm going to jump on some projects, these projects are done in the last 20 years, they are picked up from here and there. I have uh, worked on many different areas of industry, automotive industry, aviation industry, there's projects in a home uh, furnishing, there are projects in, in a sector of uh, uh, technology, communication technology and so forth. I picked up some random examples, this was a concept card done in, conceived in 1996 called Pangea. Pangea in, in means one world. It was 1996, uh, it was designed and built in Torino uh, and it was, that time we did not have World Wide Web on our desktop, uh, if you recall. Uh, based on this car later they produce a Kango, a production version car uh, with Renault and it has a, it has a uh, trolley in the back. It's a, it's a, uh, car to do research on Antarctica on an extreme environment to, to understand the environment. That time we did not have a global uh, positioning, uh, satellite positioning system. We did not have the, the navigation we have today. Those are the prototypes. That's why we had to use a disk. There's a 360 degree camera on the top and all the mechanical devices. It has a hybrid engine way ahead of its time and you have a amazing uh, digital technological environment inside. Now, let's not forget this was conceived and designed and made in 1996. There's a flat panel display. Those days you used to have a big CRT tubes, cathode ray tubes. There's a telemedia camera on the top, like you see there, that we made it work. These are some of those pioneering projects I had a privilege to work on. And you see the possibility to work in a remote places and send the information on the environment and then do research because that was the time when first time we discovered the ozone layer and the troubles with the ozone layer and, and so forth. Uh, I'm going to go further, there have been lots of other technological projects you will see further. This was a digital uh, wallet conceived in 1997 and prototype in 1997 uh, working closely with Mr. Sam Petrora at that time and uh, this is a touch sensitive screen. Now look at the design language, look at the interaction. This is 1997. I don't need to tell 2001 is the time we got the first iPod. So this was well ahead of its time. Uh, and this was speci specifically targeted towards uh, elderly citizens, senior citizens, and especially on healthcare, personal healthcare kind of thing. Well ahead of its time, again, remain a prototype, but I'm here to share with you. So basically giving all your information about, which is today's reality, most of your iPhone has most, lots of these features. You see that it's a tiny, tiny object. This is another object which, had, which was again a conceptual thinking about digital products. Can we have a digital business card instead of a, of a card, like a paper card we use, exchanging information that was another using first time the Blu-ray technology, Bluetooth technology. And this is a, another product, something completely simple object to, for your home uh, kitchen cleaning, steam cleaner. This is the first uh, uh, media camera, that time there was no satellite GPS communication, so you could gather the news and communicate the, the news directly. It's an early prototype conceived and, and made in 1995, later produced by Philips. So this is another bad slide from that time, it's another first flat uh, panel computer, that time we did not have a flat computer like this, conceived and made in 1995, especially for students, there's a 3D camera on the top, so you could transmit 3D images and that technology we're going to have it within a few years, very very soon now. Now having done all this technological product, I never forgot India doing all this technological product, what, I've, uh, what I understood that we have a tremendous amount of culture of making things, but somehow it is so fragmented and lost into villages and places and remote areas. So thanks to the Foundation of Fine Art and Design and Architecture in Netherlands, they gave me, awarded me a big scholarship and with that I could travel and go to remote places and I went to Basta region, that is in today's Chhattisgarh, that time was in, in Madhya Pradesh. 
There's a tribal people making these objects uh, using uh, what is called the lost wax casting process. Uh, facilities like this, you see the open furnace, the wife is helping and they're casting these objects. I worked with them two and a half years and making uh, objects, uh, everyday objects, trying to redefine it, understand the process, understand what kind of life and creation happens in a society which is not industrialized. And it was very interesting learning personally for me from that led to some of these projects. Oops, I'm going back. Here you are. Some of these projects, simple bowl, a spool, a vase, just using the same technique. Many of these objects were shown in, uh, uh, in Verona, in Abitar El Tempo, in Milan Fair, went into public collections. And that led to projects with a company like Alessi, which is very well known for design. Uh, and still we continue to work with them, stainless steel and <coughs> hanger, very humble objects from home. I think as much as I have a fascination for technology, I think we have to also look at door handles and hangers as well, which is very, very important. And I think we ignore it completely, totally here in our great nation. And if you look back in the past and look at in an anthropological sense in India, ancient past, every object is articulately made. Uh, somehow that lost and I don't know how and why, probably we can fix it. Uh, this is an object which I won tons of award. It's a simple, humble object. It's a, it's, a, it's a fruit basket made from industrial glass. I'm not going to technical details of how it is made. That's where the innovation lies. It's manufactured an Italian company called RSVP from Pesaro. And we go further. Talking about identity, which has occupied my mind for a long time, uh, design is uh, the profession which creates a tangible result in any given area. And I always, we all designers are somehow obsessed with objects, products, and particularly chairs. Don't ask me why, but it has a reason to, to exist. And I want you to create what can be that identity, sensorial quality we had in ancient past. If you look in Gandhara, where a lot of people here in crowd comes from Punjab, or you look back all the way up in the state I come from, that is Maharashtra in Ajanta, you find amazing, refined, culture of object making. Somehow we lost, I don't know how and why, and I think that's a very fantastic topic. Uh, one of our dear friends, she has left, would be nice to take as a research, how come we lost that ability. But here, I, I wanted to challenge myself and understand and create icon, create understanding of this. If this project took me seven years. I didn't give up. I started in a remote part in Buster. I wanted to use the same process of making into a big iconic chair. In, in a seamless casting, this is a lost wax casting process, uh, this is a wax work. I, I must say that after giving many, many tries, it, it didn't succeed. I tried it in Amsterdam, it didn't succeed. Finally, we had to go to Italy and, and work with many different artisans and, and, and make it happen. And this is the wax work, this is the casted work, it succeeded. And that is the final result, which was a journey from 2000 to 2007. In 2007, it was presented at the uh, Design Miami Basel in Basel. It was uh, very well received. Later, it went into many public collections in the museums, Victoria Albert and the Applied Art Museum in, in Cologne. But the idea behind here is what was a great learning for me, understanding of our own cultural heritage and applying that in an industrial setting. And going further, these are some other examples for a company called Capellini, which is a very iconic company, manufacturing products uh, in Italy, northern Italy, and distributing. And there are several pieces in our lobby here. You see them. That's how it is made using a scanning technology. That's the final product. Mass manufactured using um, uh, molding techniques. This is another playful product done for a company called Moroso. Here in the lobby you find lots of their pieces as well. This was to celebrate 50 years of Moroso. So this is the making of it, lots of technology in making, scanning, uh, prototyping. Uh, this is how one could sit on it, or you could sit on this like that, or you could sit something like this. And this is one of the very pioneering um, industrial is from, from Italy, founder of company, great company called Cartel. He came to my exhibition, he was 1992, asking me some of the most toughest questions. Sadly, he died a few years later. But he started the culture of innovation, which I have a great respect for. 
Going further to industrial product, that's my great fascination, though I do a lot of these engagement with trying to work with artisans, learning from them, engaging with them. At the same time, cultivating my own skills and sensibilities, but my great passion and fascination is to do industrial design, design for mass manufacturing. And here I will show you some examples, humble example like a, like a, like a door handle company like uh, Colombo who, ha who has a tremendous amount of investment in robotics, manufacturing, those are the prototypes. This is all a factory in Bergamo close to Milano. There is no human being working on a factory, it is all robotics, you know. Interesting, very precise production of a door handle. They produce objects with the high precision and that's the final object. From there I go to another industrial product uh, manufactured in an in a, in area of Bologna, Areti. It's a shelving system made just with the three components. It's extrusion manufacturing and can be used in a different kind of uh, setting in office or in a domestic environment. Last but not the least, I want to show you one of the industrial products where hopefully I've managed to connect all the dots. I'm concerned about cultural heritage, identity and also creating a unique universal product. Uh, I was invited to design a radiator. Like all of you know, in a colder cli climate, radiator is a, is a very essential thing. And I came out with the idea of a radiator as a system which can be integrated in architecture. And this is a system which took us really tremendous amount of engineering investment, uh, lots of prototyping uh, to finally, and lots of meetings, tons of investment into technology and manufacturing into making this product which you see here being tested, assembled, uh, heat radiation being tested, mass manufacturing in the industry close to Veneto in Venice and that's the final product. That's the electric version. That's how one could use it in an in a environment. You can use it like that and it's into quite some public collections. It's went into Central Pompidou public collection at the same time it's a successful industrial product in manufactured from Italy. Now all of these things we could do as well here. I raised this point last time as well. I was in the same venue sharing time with uh, Angad Paul at the first India Design Forum. And at the first India Design Forum also I gave examples of post-World War Japan as well as Italy and how we could as well do those things and there is some missing links that we need to work on uh, and I'm, I'm sure and I'm confident those things could happen. And, and those kind of collaborative discussion I hope gathering like this brings together and we discuss issues which are even more crucial related to health as you mentioned and some other issues which I also consider crucial like everyday reality of objects. On the last bit I want to talk again go back to space. Yesterday somebody said before the Neil Armstrong landed on, on moon there was already a Punjabi there sitting there. But anyway I, allow me to take you to another time to moon if you so this is Mr. Peter Diamond. This, this is the once I had a talk with him at my studio uh, discussing about some of these things uh, with my fascination for technology leading to another, another kind of reality. And last year, uh, one wonderful opportunity came in 2000, not a year before last year I should say because that was 2011, um, to think about what could be life on the moon. Now this sounds like a far-fetched reality and then suddenly question comes, we have tons of th things to fix here on our nation, in our country, in our, on our planet. Why worry about the moon? Well, we could talk about that and I have my reasons to worry about that as well. Uh, but without getting into details of that here, I would like to show you one conceptual project which was done. Uh, here is a provocation, this is a concept. This is to think if everybody goes to the moon, probably the teeny many problems we have on the planet Earth as we travel, our horizons go bigger. So I hope everybody get to see the beautiful earth rise from the moon and this is not just a joke but actually it has, a, it, is a, it has certain truth in it. We have moon as a resource, you, we all know the Chandrayaan mission sent by the Indian Space Research Organization discovered that there is a possibility there is a water on the moon, it could be a future resource for us as well. Thinking from that and provocating that everybody should get a chance to experience a the earth rise and get a bit more sensible in our act. Uh, this is a reality happened a few years ago. You know this man who was taken to the moon by this man on the right side, Peter Diamandis, to experience gravity, zero gravity, to space. I think every grandmother 
from India could go to outer space. I believe in that. There has been a lot of work happening as we speak um, on that front as well. And you see these are some of the experiments. And there's a small reality I would like to bring into in front of you that as you go in outer space, your angle of vision changes on a gravity. Your angle of vision in a vertical direction changes by significantly by 35 degrees. And I wanted to bring that experience, if at all you get a chance to go to the moon, what will be that experience, how would you that experience that? And I design a simple gauge, I call a moonwalker, a kind of a hiking gauge on the moon. So this is the reality, this has been discovered a long time ago. And understanding that perce perception reality, I created an object, that's how it looks. It's a, it's a gauge, it's a walking stick, if you like to call it has a feature called a moonwalker, it has a marking on the front and uh, that's how it looks like, it's very articulately made it's, it was exhibited in a, in a moon life exhibition in the city of Utrecht close to Amsterdam just few months ago and it has a viewfinder by which you can look at it and understand how your perception changes if tomorrow you get an opportunity to go to the moon and it's very articulately made it has a provocation that it should be manufactured on the moon, not here and sent there so that's why it's called Made on the Moon and uh, that's how the object looks like and thank you very much, thank you for having me.